Welcome back. This is Chris, my brother in Christ, Stephen. Welcome back. Uh, date today is September 18th, Year of Our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, 2019. Mm -hmm. And the title of this video is going to be called Calvinism. Calvinism. And uh, I've heard about Calvinism and I thought it was good. You know, it definitely has inroads into the Protestant Reformation. So then I started looking into it and it does have some serious errors. So this is not about anything about condemnation, but we're just students and we want to talk about these things and uh, uh, make sure that we're preaching um, about the gospel of the kingdom uh, by the word of God, which is inspired by God and not man-made tradition. So uh, this is uh, Calvinism by uh, the Brian Cole. I mean, I know I'm using a lot of these lately, but they are really good. And mm -hmm. Brian is based upon uh, those that search the scripture. So we should be able to, if somebody's talking about um, Calvinism, uh, we should be able to talk about these things and see if they relate to the word of God, if that doctrine relates to the word of God. If it doesn't, then we should not embrace it. And if you're talking to somebody, go, well, you know, the, Calvinism is a mystery and you got to take years to study it or this or that. That is a red flag, ladies and gentlemen, because the scriptures is available to all, even the children. Um, and so it is not about um, much education to understand the Bible. So, uh, well, let's begin. Oh, we already are beginning. All right. So Calvinism is a theological system that is often defined by the acronym TULIP. I'll write that down real quick. Um, TULIP. It's uh, T U L I and P. So, can they see that, Stephen? Uh, yes. Okay. So, when you're looking at the T, the T stands for total depravity. Uh, by total depravity, where uh, Calvinists mean total inability to do good, to seek after God. Uh, man is incapable of even saying yes to the gospel call. <laughs> Consequently, Calvinists then ask a question, quote, in light of the scriptures that declare man's true nature as being utterly lost and incapable, how is it possible for anyone to choose or desire God? End quote. The answer prompted by the doctrine is he can't. Therefore, God must predestine. That is, God must arbitrarily will or decree that someone will be saved. That, of course, prompts us to the U in TULIP. So what it is, is this is known as the five points of Calvinism. And let's just take a moment here. See, one, if you do not, one leads to the next, leads to the next, leads to the next. And if you remove one of them, you really do not have, you're really kind of um, missing uh, Calvinism. Go ahead, my brother. Yeah, it also says that uh, God must first decide to intervene in the, thor in the form of a third personality within the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And it's like, really? Yeah, that's very dangerous. Now, uh, now let's just take a or, moment. It says, otherwise the person is lost forever. Right, so that means that, that God, there were automatons that we can't yeah, choose. We have no choice. Yeah, and, and the absolutely. whole thing is we do have free will. Um, and that's the reason why this world is such a mess. And a lot of times people go, I just can't understand how God would allow this and this and this. Do you know why? Because he wants free will. He's mm -hmm. given us free will to choose. Now, total depravity, there, the aspect here is that we all have sinned, right? We're under original sin by the fall of Adam and Eve specifically Adam, and now we're on, we have sin nature, we're in a fallen state, so yes, we have all sin. That is accurate, uh, because that's in uh, Romans, I believe, 3.23. But to say that, that we are totally depraved, that we can't even know God, that we can't even choose Him, that He has to intervene and choose us and to predestinate us, really removes free will out of the equation. And a lot of times, I really disagree with that because a lot of times, when you're, your worst point in time is when you seek God, when you seek Jesus yeah. Christ. Now when everything's going great, it's kind of like that concept, there is no uh, 
atheists in foxholes. And it also says it's total inability. Well, that's not of God. God is not going to give us anything that we can't handle. We're going to be have the ability to handle anything that comes our way. Right, and we're going to have the ability to choose Him, to seek Him. That's what He wants. Um, so, all right, so then that leads into, because you're totally depraved, then it leads into what? You of TULIP, which stands for unconditional election. Calvinism's view of election is unconditional election means that God has not has not foreseen a response on our part that contributes to his choosing to save us instead election is solely God's sovereign decision to save whomever he is pleased to save which prompts the L in tulip so now we have we're totally depraved we can't approach God at all so therefore we have unconditional, unconditional election that he chooses, he predestines who will be saved and who won't. So in this concept of this is the concept of predestination that God divided humanity into two groups. One group is the elected. It includes all to those God has chosen to make knowledge by himself. The rest will remain ignorant of God and the gospel. Their damned will spend eternity in hell without any hope of mercy or cessation of the extreme tortures. God... God made this selection before the universe was created, and thus before humans existed. The grounds or grounds that God uses to select the lucky few is, is unknown. It, what is known is that it is not through any good works on the part of the individual. It is not that he extends knowledge to some in order to find out who will accept salvation and who will not. Wow. Right. It's very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. Yeah, because now it's just automatons. We're dealing with this aspect that then really is... Why do we even need Jesus Christ if he's already determined everything? Why well, try to do it? Why? You know, yeah. It doesn't matter. And then you're going, and then they, you can get into this concept. I'm skipping ahead, but then it's like, well, you know, it's God's will yeah. that all this stuff and happening in the world is his will. And it's like, no, it isn't, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. We have free will and we have chosen, and sin has consequences. Isn't it interesting that in the 40s and 50s, in America, you could leave your keys in your car, leave your house open. You didn't have to worry about your kids being stolen and 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 tortured and hurt. You know, and we're the same people. You know, right. except now nobody wants to let their kids out of their sight. They lock everything up, and we live in fear all the time. Right, right. So I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um. So we have this progression. We have tulip. We have the T, total depravity. Then we have unconditional election. And then that leads us into limited atonement. Now this is where it's very, very dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. Limited atonement. We must spend some time on that. Limited atonement. This means that Christ's atonement was fully effective to accomplish its design of redemption for all those for whom it was intended. That is, its intention was limited to the elect, like Stephen just mentioned. Limited to the elect. In other words, Jesus didn't die for all, to save all humans. Right, and we're going we're gonna to cover scripture and see if that's accurate or not. Because we should be able to say, does Calvinism fit in with the word of God? No. Um, so limited atonement, this means that Christ's atonement was fully effective to accomplish its design of redemption for all those for whom it was intended. That is, its intention was limited to the elect. By this, Calvinists acknowledge that the atonement Christ provided for sins is in some way limited from the greatest possible extent it could have in theory. Calvinists acknowledge that this demands the eye of irresistible grace. So now we have, we're totally depraved, we can't approach God, God has to choose us, that means it's unconditional election, and then it goes in limited atonement, there's only a few that God has designed before he created heaven and earth, he's just designed who is the elect, who isn't, and that leads into irresistible grace. Um, by irresistible grace... Uh, we see Calvinists mean that the Holy Spirit changes the inclination and disposition of human will of the elect so that those who were previously unwilling to receive Christ are now willing to be saved. Practically speaking, according to irresistible grace, an individual is born again before being saved. Think about that for a second. He's born again before being saved. Yeah. 
No, ladies and gentlemen, because if God chooses everything, then you have to have irresistible grace. And let's say I'm in a sin nature, I'm totally depraved, and the Holy Spirit comes in and forces me to follow because God has elected me. I'm part of the elect just by His choice. Yeah, that's the belief that every human who God has elected will inevitably come to the knowledge of God, and the elect cannot resist the call. They don't have free will. Right, there isn't free will. Now, now see, and, the, and then that gets them very dangerous because this can turn a lot of people off. So, perseverance of the saints, that's the last part. Perseverance of the saints, as Calvinists say, that since God has drawn the elect to faith in Christ by regenerating their hearts and convincing them of their sins, thus saving individuals by his own work and power, the natural conclusion follows that they will be kept by the same power to the end. So God just kind of forces limited atonement. This is not a message for all is basically what this is about. The gospel is not for all. It's only for the elect. And it says once saved, always saved belief that everyone's been saved will remain in that state even before they were born. Even before they're born. Yeah. I think you have to make that choice. So let's take a moment to talk about you know, this is a system that is a progression from one point to another, and it's dependent upon whether each point is valid. If one point is not valid, really the whole system kind of crumbles. You have people that talk about, well, I'm just a, a four-point Calvinist. Well, the five-point Calvinists are right because they're like, well, if you, um, if you miss one of the points, then you're really not adhering to the system. So let's just spend a moment on the, um, the L in TULIP, uh, referring to limited atonement. Uh, how about John 3, 16 through 17? John 3, 16 through 17. John, Mark, John, John 3, yes. 16 through 17. Okay, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Right. Well, we see that um, the most commonly rejected point on um, Calvinism is limited atonement. The reason is clear. The fact that Calvinists will limit the availability to the unconditionally elect is the issue. Uh, what some Calvinists grapple with is whether the Lord arbitrarily selects some prior to their birth and elects them to and elects them to damnation. Some Calvinists would give a hearty amen to that idea. Others are appalled. Uh, so it is a very broad deal. So folks, when we're talking about Calvinism, there is many different factions, but we're just dialoguing about uh, uh, the the heart of Calvinism. Uh, so we see there's a variety of opinion abroad. Uh, so, but verses uh, John 3.16, as Stephen has, has read, are interpreted to mean, and here the argument grows, uh, really muddled, really, this is confusion here, that the world means only the elect. Yeah. Because it says, for God so what? Love the world? Uh, what does it say in John 3.16? I'd like to back up one verse to John 3.15. It says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Whosoever believeth in him and should not perish but Stephen, have eternal life. Stephen's right on point here because there is, we're going to spend some time here. There's a lot going on right here. Um, so for God so loved the world, he loved what? The elect or did he love mm -hmm. the world? Uh, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have. And then, right, he goes back to verse 15. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Whosoever. Yep. That's a pretty broad thing. Yeah, so yeah. this is the scripture. It's not like, well, does it say only the elect that believeth in him should not perish? But it says whosoever believeth. All right. Now we can cross-reference this with what about John 3, 36. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Right, right. Um, so what about John 6, verse 40? So we're seeing that if you believe on the Son, you have everlasting life. 
And if he believe not the Son, shall not see life but the wrath of God. So this is about, this is not inclusive, it's exclusive to all who want to um, come to Jesus Christ. John 640, and this is the will of him that sent me, <coughs> that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Right, right, absolutely. Now, if we go back to um, uh, John uh, 3, verse 16, uh, it does have, remember when you're dealing with the King James Bible as a built-in dictionary, and it's going to go back and forth, it's going to go back to the Old Testament. So I thought, thought this was interesting. Uh, if we look at uh, John 3, verse 15, it gives a reference, oh, actually go back to verse 14. Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Right. So, going back to 15 for a moment, let me close out my thought. It says, Word, what, whosoever is not, they say, well, it's not in the original. Well, then, then you're talking about every translation that has whosoever, or anyone, or everyone, this is applied to. So, the Lord, Jesus, utters this amazing promise in the context of like as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, right? Didn't you just read that, Stephen? Yes. All right. Now, that is a reference to what, ladies and gentlemen? It's reference to the Old Testament, Numbers 21, verse 9. Numbers 21, verse 9. Um, Stephen, you got that? Yeah, have it just a second. Numbers, okay. numbers 21, 9? Yes. <clears throat> numbers 21, 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. All right. So we see, uh, what is this saying? One finds that of anyone bitten by the serpent, who hasn't been, right? They were all bitten. A lot well, of them were so bitten. In, up in Numbers 2, 21, verse 6, it says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of much people of Israel died. Right, and then Moses intervened yeah. and prayed, and, and he says, we have sinned. So he goes, all right, here's what, what you need to do. And he says, uh, isn't it saying whosoever, right? Moses made a, a serpent that came past, and he beheld. And, it, you know, anybody that wanted to go and be healed, Correct. They, they would look at the serpent on the pole and were saved. There was nothing a, a person could do, no anti-venom, he could concoct, no tourniquet, he could apply, which would otherwise save him. Yet all, all could look, right? Right. The Lord Jesus Christ utilizes this historical example and figuratively liken himself to the serpent on the pole saying what? Whosoever believeth will be saved. Right. That's what it's saying. Right there, ladies and gentlemen. So this is not just about the elect because, you know, you, you realize in Israel, a lot of Israelites were dying that yeah. were God's chosen people because they were rebellious mm -hmm. and sinful and they loved to worship Satan more than God. They loved Egyptian mythology. They are always wanting to go back to Egypt, which means they wanted to go back to Babylon. They even wanted to sacrifice their own children. Uh, just as a lot of people will want to do that as well via abortion. Yeah, they're doing that today. Yeah, yeah, same thing. And then probably putting in our food, which is oh, really yeah. disgusting. Um, all right, so what about um, what about First John? First John, two, verse two. First John two, verse two. Verse two, and he is the propitiation for our sins. Not only for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Wow. So that isn't that doesn't sound like just for the elect, does it? It no. sounds for the what does it say, the whole world? Yeah, the whole world. For the sins of the whole world. Well, that's the whole world, isn't it? Yep. Hmm. So, you know what he says in verse one, he says, My little children, these things I write unto you that ye that ye sin not. You know, children have such an openness for the truth, ladies and gentlemen. And it's showing that children can understand the gospel. Mm -hmm. Children can understand the scripture. Today, we've been sold the lie that we have to get our doctrine from uh, the intelligentsia. And the intelligentsia is nothing but an extension of Rome today. That's a fact, ladies and gentlemen. 
Most of what the church uses is a Roman Greek counterfeit text with 60,000 words removed. And they, they, they just go, as long as I'm not choosing the authorized 1611 version, that's okay with me. So I digress, but it's saying what? What's it saying? Jesus Christ, the righteous, the propitiation. Now, the propitiation means to appease and make favorable. It means to uh, conciliate. It means to expiate. Expiate, expiator, expiatory. But expiate. What does expiate mean, ladies and gentlemen? It means to put an end to. To atone for. Uh, making atonement. The means by which atonement is made. So he made an atonement, the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins, the sins of the whole world. Now then, of course, he gives a cross-reference there, and that cross-reference would be what? Isaiah, Isaiah 53, verse 6. Isaiah 53, verse 6. Isaiah 53. And this is about the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. 53, uh, verse 6 through 8, actually. 53, 6 through 8. Uh, and we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shear is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. And when he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare to his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, and he was stricken. Right, that's a prophecy, ladies and gentlemen, of the Lord Jesus Christ, right there. And that's why we, when you're talking about the the authorized version, 1611 authorized version, what are you looking at? You're looking at the New Te the Old Testament is 300 prophecies about the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of people that say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You got the Society of Jesus, which is really the Society of Satan. Um, yeah, people preaching um, Jesus, another Jesus, and another gospel. But this is about true Christianity, folks, about being believing, about contending for the faith. So, as we're talking about this, this is what it's about. Now, he came to make a sacrifice for the whole world, folks. I, I think that it's pretty straightforward, is it not? This is not about limited atonement. Yeah. This is about atonement unlimited. for all the world. Unlimited. Now, now, you could say limited in the aspect that uh, few there be will find it. What is that? Matthew 7, verse 13, right? Uh, Matthew 7 verse 13 it talks about the waves of the world is is uh, wide and broad and we just got done talking about the uh, the the emerging church is a wide and broad movement that leads to destruction leads to eternal separation from God enter ye in at the straight gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And, and the few are those that have by free will have chosen to accept the free gift to be saved. And that is what it's about. But this aspect of tulip, ladies and gentlemen, is very very dangerous and leads to a oh, worthy elect not by what we've done but because god chose us folks that leads to that leads to a kind of a hitler mindset ladies and gentlemen it leads it's very dangerous it it leads to pride it's of the flesh really is that isn't that is not going to really uh create a love of spreading the gospel mm -hmm. you know what's the good news then right it's all been determined what's the point <laughs> um, and a lot of times people will say, well, there's some wonderful Calvinists, and so therefore they were, they were um, spreading the gospel of the kingdom. Yes, they were, despite Calvinism, because they were well-founded in the Word of God. They were moved by the Holy Spirit because He had the love of Scripture, 
and they had the love of the gospel and they wanted to share the gospel to the world. I just wanted to know, how do they figure out who's the elect and who's not? Good question. Right? I, I don't know. Maybe we'll have to uh, continue. That's a great question. Who's the elect? Well, apparently if you're a Calvinist, you're part of the elect, maybe. <laughs> so... And, uh, if you donate a certain amount, or well, it's, we don't want to get we don't want to say the Roman Catholic, but I'm just saying that it, it's dangerous. Now, it is true that God hates certain things. He hates He hates sin, right? There are six things that God hates. Yeah, even seven. Proverbs six sixteen. You're looking at the Old Testament. There's a lot of things that God hates, right? He hates the doctrine of the Nicolaitan. Uh, he uh, He goes on to say that the bloody and deceitful man He hates, right? Uh, again, denoting the accountability of the individual. Yet, God also loved the world and himself is himself love. Uh, what about Psalm 5.5? 5, 5? Uh, Psalm 5.5. 5. So, yeah, he does hate the, the sin. He hates the unrighteousness. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all the workers of iniquity. Yeah. Psalm 5.5. 5. Yeah, so he hates the workers of iniquity, does he not? Yes. Uh, what do we have? Uh, Psalm 11.15. Wow, time flies when we're mm -hmm. getting into the Word of God. Uh, Psalm 11.15? 11, 11.5, 11, actually. I was fixing to say. Uh, the Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked, and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Right, right. So, and we were going to go on, but this does not abrogate, ladies and gentlemen, this does not abrogate that he sent his son into the world uh, to, to be a propitiation for the sins of the world. For he came in this world, he died for me, personally. He died for my brother Stephen. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. he also died for the sins of the world. Yes, it, so that is the aspect of, well, you know, God wills everything. He wills uh, uh, rape and murder and all. No, he doesn't. He doesn't, he doesn't. he doesn't abrogate that. He doesn't support that. We have free will. And so this is about the gospel of the kingdom, the good news, not limited atonement, but atonement for all through Jesus Christ. God bless you. Bye.